Tonight on the campaign trail, a $6 billion promise. It's time for a universal tax cut. The Conservatives make a big pitch to middle class voters, but how will they pay for it? And problem candidates under fire. Is an apology enough? The war room strategists are here. A bus full of students crashes in BC. Was the road too dangerous? Almost 12 minutes of just nonstop guns. Seven shooters ambush a park in Mississauga, just outside of Toronto, and an innocent teenage boy is killed. This is The National. It is the weekend, but with the federal election looming, there are no days off for party leaders. And today, major announcements from both the Conservatives and the NDP, and a major appearance by the Liberals. Heading into week two of the campaign, party leaders are trying to stay on message and knock their opponents off. Throughout this campaign, Sundays here at the National will have a political focus, along with the other big stories of the day. We will look at the issues that matter to you. We will go inside the war room strategy break down the polls and hear from voters like you trying to make sense of it all. Speaking to them today, Andrew Scheer headed straight for the bottom line, announcing a plan to cut income taxes. Salima Shivji explains who stands to benefit and what it could cost. You got your forms out already. <laughs> Months ahead of tax season, Andrew Scheer chose this BC couple's living room to make a campaign promise he hopes will hit home. I wish I could say life has gotten easier for Canada's middle class, but it has not. A quick jab at his Liberal opponent before outlining his solution, lowering the tax rate for the lowest income bracket, from 15% to 13.75 over the next four years. More disposable income for voters, less revenue for Ottawa, eventually amounting to a loss of about $6 billion a year, says the Parliamentary Budget Officer. The Conservatives have long championed broad tax cuts. This one is not as dramatic as the one Stephen Harper promised to get elected in 2005. We are going to give consumers a tax cut that no politician can take away. Slashing the much-hated GST, but it's in the same spirit. And in line with Scheer's message of more money in voters' pockets. In 2015, Justin Trudeau made a similar promise in another family's living room. Making sure that families like yours have all the opportunities they can to succeed. To a tax cut to the second income bracket aims squarely at the middle class. Shear's version will reach more taxpayers, even the wealthy, but not everyone equally. If you earn less than the top limit on that first bracket, then you don't get the maximum full benefit of the tax cut. The other open question, how this tax cut squares with the Tory promise to get rid of the deficit in five years. We're going to get back to balanced budgets while we find ways to lower taxes, put money back in the pockets of Canadians. In the coming days, we'll be showing Canadians exactly how we're going to protect core services, balance the budget, and lower taxes. No clear answer from Andrew Scheer. He's hoping people will stay focused on the tax cut and not possible cuts to services that could be needed to pay for it. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. So that was Scheer's planned messaging today. But again today, he was dogged by questions about candidates who've made offensive online comments in the past. Katie Simpson now with his reason for standing by them. Andrew Scheer is trying to focus on wooing new voters rather than attacks, mostly from the Liberals, over some of his candidates' social media history. Look, I think we all have to acknowledge the fact that people can make mistakes and people can own up to that. In a rare mid-flight news conference, Scheer said as long as a candidate apologizes for offensive words, he or she can still run for his party. Seven conservatives have been called out for old social media posts or comments deemed controversial, homophobic or racist. Most have been brought to light by the Liberals, dumping the material on Twitter for all to see. The average Canadians, they're seeing more, more of it, I think, but in some ways I actually think they're kind of getting desensitized right. to it. The NDP has booted one candidate over aggressive comments aimed at pipeline activists. But the party leader appears willing to also accept apologies. I believe that people can change and improve. and I think that we should be open to that. That's my position. It depends. Scheer today did not see it necessary to apply the apology standard to his 2005 speech in the House of Commons, opposing same-sex marriage, comparing it to a dog's tail. 
What I indicated last night is that it's all about the way, whether or not people support fundamental equality rights and whether or not they show respect to uh, every Canadian and every group within Canada. Scheer says the attacks against his candidates are part of a liberal distraction campaign, a way to divert attention from Justin Trudeau's record. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Comox, British Columbia. Another issue today on the campaign trail, gun violence. All of the major party leaders were asked about a fatal shooting Saturday evening just outside of Toronto. Police describe it as a targeted ambush. But the 17-year-old boy who died at the scene wasn't even a target. Another five people were shot. And as Shannon Martin tells us, police are seeking at least seven suspects. It, it didn't stop. Like almost, so almost 12 minutes of just non-stop guns. When Jiva Haripasad heard the gunfire, he didn't hesitate. He ran to help. What he found was a gruesome scene in all six people bleeding from gunshots, mostly teenagers. An innocent bystander, 17-year-old Jonathan Davis, was killed. This family friend says his mother was with him during his final moments. When she looked over, she saw him laying there on the ground a couple of doors down from where she lived. She was able to go to him. She applied pressure to his wound, which was um, a gunshot to the head, um, at the side of his head, and she um, wanted to see if she could resuscitate him. Right now she's just beside herself. She doesn't understand um, what's, what, what happened. There was an ice cream tr truck located within the complex, and there were families gathered around the ice cream truck. And those parents and children fled in the heel of bullets. It was around 6.20 Saturday evening when at least seven people suddenly appeared in a park behind this housing complex armed with semi-automatic handguns. They covertly approached the side of the building dressed in dark clothing and then when they got themselves into position they indiscriminately opened fire. A targeted ambush-style attack. More than 100 shell casings found littered across the lawn. The police chief believes it's all connected to a couple of rap videos, one that was shot earlier and one that was going to be filmed last night. He says something in the video motivated the attack. All the suspects immediately ran, and it's believed so did all the intended targets, the group filming the music video. The chief says most of the people caught in the crossfire we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Police are now appealing for witnesses to come forward, especially the driver of that ice cream truck. Shannon Martin, CBC News, Mississauga. Gun control and safety were always going to be part of the election campaign, but today leaders were forced to respond and were asked what they would do to help. We will, of course, be talking a lot about uh, community safety and uh, gun control in the coming, uh, coming months, uh, coming weeks. The Liberals have been considering a ban on handguns and assault weapons for months, musing about letting municipalities restrict firearms themselves. That's what Toronto and Montreal have been calling for. The Liberals would not commit to this today. We took some significant measures to strengthen gun control in the past, uh, in the past mandate, um, measures that uh, Andrew, Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives have uh, committed to repeal uh, moving forward. Uh, we know there's more to do and we will be doing more. The NDP says more should be done to deal with the root causes of violence, but also says it would support cities banning handguns. If a jurisdiction, if a municipality wants to make that decision, uh, not just to ban uh, semi-automatics, semi but to even handguns that aren't semi-automatic, we've made that position clear that we would support them, to, uh, support them to do so. Instead of restricting guns, the Conservative leader wants to give more resources to police and target gangs. We need better laws to deal with things like uh, the bail conditions that known gang members receive. Uh, that's why we need uh, greater cooperation between different police agencies. Ultimately, all political parties want to be seen as protecting Canadian safety while balancing the rights of law-abiding gun owners, which can be a tough sell in some rural areas. But big cities dealing with gun violence also have a lot of voters, so no doubt gun control will be an issue during this campaign. To Quebec now, where Jagmeet Singh unveiled his plan for the province, trying to recapture the excitement and the seats the NDP once held there. Our plan is something that no other party can offer this this combination of recognizing social injustice, environmental justice, uh, the importance and unique identity of Quebec and defending it, we are confident that people will see in us their champions, and I'm going to let the people of Quebec decide. 
The platform includes more money for Quebec cultural organizations and gives $73 million more million to the province's immigration ministry. That would be used to help integrate newcomers and teach them French. NDP support soared in Quebec under Jack Layton in 2011 but has been struggling ever since. But winning Quebec will not be easy for the NDP. In the polls right now, they are fighting for fifth place behind everyone but the People's Party of Canada. CBC poll analyst Eric Grenier lays out the latest numbers for Quebec and Canada. Rosie, we're looking at a really tight race nationwide, so let's pull up those national polling averages from the poll track. You can see it's a tight race between the Conservatives and the Liberals, with each of them at about 34% support. We have the New Democrats there now in third with about 14%, and the Greens, 10%, the Bloc Québécois, 4%, and Maxime Bernier's People's Party is at 3%. But it's this race between the Liberals and the Conservatives. It's been very close for a few weeks now, but the Liberals are probably in a better spot because of big leads they have in places like Ontario and Quebec. So let's take a look at the Quebec number they're really important to the Liberals' re-election hopes. They have 36% support right now in the province. They're trailed by the Conservatives, who have 22%. The Bloc Québécois, 19%. That's exactly where they were in the last election. But what's changed is down here between the Greens and the New Democrats, each at about 9.5% support. We saw Jagmeet Singh was in Quebec today, trying to make his pitch to Quebecers. He needs to gain some ground there, because he is in trouble. If we look at the seat projections in the province, it shows why, for the Liberals, it is so important, Quebec. They're right now projected to win somewhere around 52 seats. That would be a gain of about 12. And a lot of them are in the regions, the francophone regions of Quebec, which shows why the Bill 21 debate is a very delicate one for the Liberals. Conservatives are at 14 seats in our projections, the Bloc Québécois at 12, which is what they would need for official party status. The New Democrats, with the numbers we're seeing in Quebec right now, we'd project they would not win a seat in the province. Thanks, Eric. We also want to tell you about some special coverage you'll see here in the coming weeks from The National. We are bringing undecided voters from across the country face-to-face -face with the federal leaders. And I'll help those voters get the answers they need, they want. The first of four special programs will air two weeks from tonight. And a little later on the show, we'll take you to Quebec to talk about one of the biggest issues for voters there and other places, the cost of living. That we can just go to the kind of David Common is in one of the most affordable places in the country and finds even they are struggling. Where do you think your money goes? Plus, millennials could decide this election. So what matters to them? And our new Sunday political panel is standing by. We'll take you inside the war room in about 10 minutes. Let's turn now to other news. Two people are dead. Three others have serious injuries after a bus carrying 48, most of them university students, rolled down an embankment. The bus company insists the driver is experienced. The bus passed inspection. The questions now are about the road they traveled. It happened Friday night in a rural area on Vancouver Island, so south of Port, Port Alberni, excuse me, here. The students were traveling to the village of Bamfield along a gravel logging road. Travel Tanya Fletcher went to the site, relatively remote, considered by locals as treacherous. This bus met tragedy on a dark night in the rain along a remote road with no cell reception. It was packed with University of Victoria students on a two-day research trip to the Bamfield Marine Sciences Centre. The bus was travelling along this gravel road, narrow and filled with potholes, when it plunged down a ravine. Two students died at the scene while a complex rescue unfolded. The number of passengers were up on the road and there were still uh, trapped people in the, in the coach itself. But when we got here, there were still uh, pulling up people from the bus mm -hmm. by using a rope. I seen a rope over here. Local First Nations leader Robert here. Dennis was on scene that night and says the driver may have been trying to make way for an oncoming vehicle. So you spoke with the bus driver. What did yeah. he tell you about how it happened? Well, he said he, he was meeting the car. The, well, he didn't know it was a Jeep. He was meeting another vehicle with bright lights. And I guess that's what caused him to pull over. This isn't just a remote logging road, it's a key access point. Not only the only road access into and out of the local First Nations, but also to Bamfield, the Marine Science Research Station, and tourists hiking the popular West Coast Trail. This is the part that we call the washboard. It's always really, really rough, you know, like the old washboards. Dennis says the entire road between Port Alberni and Bamfield has long been dangerous. I can tell you right now that we probably have had up to seven of our own members killed on this road. Most of the road is privately maintained by a logging company. He's been advocating unsuccessfully for 20 years to have the province take it over so it can meet government safety standards.
for us, you know, what is it, uh, you know, the bottom line, the priority, or the safety of, of, of people using the road? Uh, Back at the crash site, traces of the tragedy remain while the investigation into what happened continues. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Bamfield, BC. U.S. officials say they have concrete evidence that Iran was behind a drone attack on a major Saudi oil facility this weekend. The attack has amped up tensions with Donald Trump tweeting tonight that the U.S. is, quote, locked and loaded. Paul Hunter has more on the fallout. The drone attack came with precision, force and results, turning parts of the giant Saudi oil facility into an inferno. It's not just an attack on Saudi Arabia, says this man. It's an attack on the entire world. And though Houthi rebels in Yemen were quick to claim responsibility, many believe they're incapable of carrying out such an attack on their own. Indeed, the U.S. now points to these satellite images showing the angles of attack as suggesting the drones could not have come from Yemen. It was quick to accuse Iran, which backs the Houthis as the driving force in the strike. Even Democrats don't disagree. I think it's safe to say that the Houthis don't have the capability to do a strike like this without Iranian assistance. The big worry is it'll all now escalate quickly. With satellite images showing the thick smoke drifting across the country, Iran now labels the U.S. accusation as maximum deceit and Iranian officials have listed a variety of U.S. military bases all within range of Iranian missiles. There's also that recent string of attacks on oil tankers in the Persian Gulf. The U.S. blames Iran but otherwise hasn't responded. Iran has shot down a U.S. surveillance drone. All of it in the continued fallout over the U.S. withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal and amid talk Donald Trump may meet with Iran's president this month at the UN. He's never, we've never committed to that meeting at the United Nations General Assembly. Said White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway today, it's up to Trump whether that meeting goes ahead, though she underlined the White House view that when it comes to diplomacy and you attack Saudi Arabia... You're not helping your case much. And so the tension grows in a region already long on edge. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Some other stories we are watching this Sunday night on The National. We're going to be out here for as long as it takes to get a fair contract. 49,000 General Motors workers in the U.S. are walking off the job tonight. They want more money, affordable health care and job security. The strike could affect production at Canadian GM plants. Shake it up. Shake it up. A blast from the past. Rick Ocasek, the lead singer of The Cars, was found dead in his apartment earlier today. The Cars were a new wave sensation in the 70s and 80s. Last year, the band was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Police say there were no signs of foul play. Ocasek was 70 years old. Now to a CBC News investigation. We went undercover and approached an immigration consulting firm for help getting permanent residency in Canada. The company's offer, a fake job with fake pay and a fake paper trail to help a would-be immigrant to buy their way in. As Jeff Leo explains, all the company asked in return was six figures. You can hear uh, him and you record both voices, right? Okay. Okay, perfect. The undercover investigation began when a CBC journalist posed as a Chinese citizen looking for a skilled job offer that would lead to permanent residency in Canada. The month-long investigation focused on a Toronto-based immigration company called Wanhanta Consulting. It involved weeks of phone conversations as well as texts on Chinese social media app WeChat. And here's what we learned about the scheme. The would-be immigrant is expected to pay a hundred $170,000 for a Canadian job. The company says much of that money would go toward paying the Canadian employer offering the position. In addition, that money would pay the workers' own wages. Juan Hanta told us it would create a fake paper trail to convince immigration officials that the job offer was legit. Immigration lawyer Richard Curlin says what Juan Hanta is offering is illegal. This is a conspiracy to violate Canada's immigration program. Erica Stanley, an immigration consultant in PEI, says there's a massive demand for this sort of scam. She is flooded with calls from would-be immigrants who want to buy their way into Canada. And they're like, well, we're willing to pay. I said, oh, well, I'm sure you are, but 
it's illegal to do that. After wrapping up our undercover investigation, we approached the company directly to ask for an on-the-record interview. So what's going on? I asked Shin Liu, who runs Wan Honta, what her company charges for job offer immigration. Um, everything includes 2000 to 5000 She also told me it would be against the law to pay for a job. And that's when I revealed we had been investigating the company for about a month. You told me you don't ever charge anybody over $5,000. Uh, and you sent a contract to me for 170000 I'm driving right now. Can I call you back? Lou never did call back. Now, Curland says these sorts of immigration schemes are rampant. He estimates that 20% of job offer files are questionable. And he says the solution is better enforcement. He hopes politicians talk about that during this federal election campaign. Jeff Leo, CBC News, Regina. Okay, time for a quick break. Next, inside the war room, five problem candidates out, not even a week into the campaign. We look at the stakes and the strategy, and later, a grand slam celebration. Tens of thousands cheer on their hometown hero. We will be right back. My name is David Hurley. My name is Shakir Chambers. My name is Michael Hay. I formerly worked for Harper's Prime Minister's Office and for the Ontario government on Doug Ford's election campaign. I ran two national campaigns for the Liberal Party under the leadership of Paul Martin. In 2017, I was Jigmeet Singh's leadership campaign director. This election will be divisive. And the last one for at least two of the major party leaders. This election will be historic. We are going to start tonight with a problem that pretty much every party is dealing with, either during the campaign or just before it. Candidates past behavior now coming to light. Already five candidates have been forced to drop out, most because of old social media posts. And there's also another strategy at play. The Liberal War Room is digging up their own videos of Conservative candidates saying controversial things. Andrew Shear's response? If anything that they've ever said in the past caused any type of uh, hurt or disrespect to uh, one community or another uh, and have apologized for that, uh, I accept that. Okay, let's bring in our War Room panel, Shakir, David, and Michael. Good to see you all again. Our second Sunday of the campaign. The elections are exciting. Yeah, <laughs> they are. Yeah. And just getting started, really. Let's let's start with this issue around candidates' past problems. We, we saw it in the last campaign, uh, but it wasn't the same numbers and it wasn't the same kind of speed at which we're seeing it now. I, I want to start with Andrew Shear's response. He did that on an airplane, middle of the night, wanted to make sure he got a handle on it. Shakir, um, is it enough just to say candidates have a policy Let's move on. Um, I think it is enough in the sense of if you add context. I think today when he gave his response, he added that contextual kind of um, analysis to it. I think if a candidate 10, 15 years ago had a, a tweet or a Facebook post that was kind of wrong, I guess you can say, I'm sorry, and I want to move forward, and I apologize. But if it's a pattern of behavior, sure. month after month, year after year, you're posting these same controversial kind of uh, messaging, then yeah, we need to revisit and kind of remove the candidate if that's the decision you want to take. It does seem to have been a pattern of behavior for at least one of the candidates that the Conservative the party is keeping, who was not greenlit by the provincial party, who has said multiple things that are offensive to multiple communities, and I guess has apologized and they're sticking, sticking with her. What, what do you make of that, David? What does that tell you about conservative strategy? Well, it's really perplexing because uh, this is not a new tactic, what the Liberal War Room is doing. In fact, the Liberal War Room in Ontario has done that in the past, and the federal Liberal War Room is being run by the Ontario Liberal War Room people. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the Conservatives themselves did it to the NDP in the provincial election right. in Ontario. So there's no excuse not for having anticipated that. The first week of the campaign, no week of the campaign has more thought given to it than the first week of the campaign. You plan it weeks, if not months in advance. You know every event you're going to, it has a strategic purpose for what you want to say yeah. in the first week. And how you would end up going to candidate after candidate who has a problem like that and not have anticipated this is, well, it's just a huge blunder. Yeah, because let, let's be clear, and maybe you can explain it a bit, Shakir, that you do vet your own candidates, right? That parties go through their own backgrounds and make sure there's nothing weird there. Absolutely. Yeah. I think on that particular point, um, there's this thing of like a calculated risk. I think for a lot of parties, not just a conservative party, there are uh, probably candidates who you think, 
might give you a certain reward in your writing, whether it's um, fundraising, whether it's media hits, whatever it may be. Mm. And you probably assess they might have a bad message on, on, on the internet, like one bad tweet. Yeah. So the reward is probably greater than like that issue, and we can manage that moving forward because sure. there's a, a sure. significant benefit. Sure. I think that might have gone into some of the considerations. I'm not 100% sure. But ultimately, I think some of these candidates, some of the things that I've seen for sure, um, one of them was like 10 or 12 years ago by a candidate, and it was used in a totally different context. In society, our bars of tolerance have raised significantly in the past 10 or 15 years. It's hard to hold somebody accountable for that same standard 10 or 15 years ago that we have today. Yeah, I mean, if you say something as a teenager uh, and now you're a candidate and you can't go back and clean your social media, right. I think some of that makes sense. What, what do you make of the sheer response, though, Michael, the way he's saying, okay, you've apologized, I can accept that. What, what does that tell you? I think that... Well, first of all, I think that Sheer tried to have a blanket apology for any future candidates as well, which is problematic and, and not good enough. Yeah. Uh, and an apology from a candidate is not the same thing as as making it clear what they believe in today. Yeah. And so we would want to make sure that anybody running for any party doesn't hold Islamophobic, racist, homophobic, yeah. or anti-women values. And I think that's that's what's really important here. I also wonder what impact this has on the election. And for me, I think voters will decide based on how the parties respond to these candidates coming forward. Do they try to hide them first? Do they stand by them, as we see Sheer standing by four or five candidates today that have said and done problematic things? Or do they drop them? Do they get rid of them as swiftly as they can and try to move on, which I think the NDP did very clearly. The yeah. other the other thing I'm thinking about too is the is that there is a moral there's a moral element to this. I don't think that candidates being Islamophobic or racist or having the wrong values, values that don't align with Canadians, should be a political strategy for the Liberals. If the Liberals know that this yeah. that candidates hold these values, then I don't think that they should be sitting on this information for strategic plays. They should be letting voters know. So I, I will say there was a Liberal candidate that the Liberals uh, had to pull before the campaign started who was saying uh, anti-Semitic things and obviously couldn't continue and they, they removed him. So it's not like... It's not like anybody's got this right. Everybody right. has problem candidates. You want to no, but everybody sure. has. I mean, like every party has <clears throat> large numbers of writings yeah. that it's very difficult to right. field a credible candidate. Yes. In, yeah. Okay. So this is not particularly a conservative problem. They may have no. a pattern of a certain type of problem mm -hmm. on social conservatism, etc. But so that isn't the issue. So the issue is, as Michael said perfectly, how do you handle it? And to get this off the table, he's already lost a week, Sheer has to, A, give a really strong statement about what his values are and what the values of the party are, and second of all, he's got to find two or three symbolic sacrificial lambs and get rid of them. Get rid of them, Shakir. I'm not sure that's, that's the case. I think two things here. I think one is that um, and when you're in this position, ultimately, none of us are getting any younger. As people move forward and we have other candidates coming out, um, the younger candidates, yeah. their whole life is going to be based on social media, right? So I think we need to get to the point where we're judging people for what they are today and not what they were 10 years ago on a certain post, right? If someone's views have evolved and they're a different person, I think we should be able to say, okay, give a second opportunity. This is why it makes Canada so great. We give people other opportunities and allow them to move forward on that message and on that different kind of uh, path that they've chosen. I think continually harping on the past of someone's behavior online I don't think that's the correct way to go about assessing our well, well, so let's let's talk about why the Liberals, not why they're doing it, it's obvious why they're doing it, and they're doing it really strategically so that when Andrew Scheer appears in a riding, that's when they drop a video because he's going to be seen with a candidate who is, you know, who has, uh, supports abortion or whatever, who has said controversial things in the past. Is this the right message for Liberals who have been always talking about a positive message, right, and sunny ways and all that stuff, and this looks like the opposite of that? I, you know, I'm not saying that these people shouldn't be exposed if they have controversial viewpoints, but I wonder how it plays to the notion that Liberals are uh, not out there to have a messy, ugly campaign. What do you think, Michael? I think it is important that the Liberals are exposing this about the Conservative candidates. I do think, though, that they should just put it all out there if they have it, and they shouldn't be sitting on it. Uh, if you know that about a candidate, voters have a right to know that this is a candidate's belief set, that mm -hmm. this is their value system. Um, I think that those Liberals are very focused, it seems, on putting the Conservatives on defense so that they can continue to run a campaign that is based on their 2015 campaign yeah. and has Justin Trudeau not running on his on his record from yeah. the last four years. Yeah. What do you think of it? I mean, I, I, I know politics is mean. I mean, I'm not, I'm not naive, but I just wonder how it plays to the brandy. 
I don't think that people will actually see this as coming from the Liberal Party. I don't think they're going to get tarred from it. Um, and it really looks, frankly, like it's coming from media. When you see the headlines, you don't see Liberals press sheer on this. You see sheer pressed on such a thing. And these things are catnip for the media. Uh, they're going to report them. So he's got to take this issue off the yeah. table. Um, or he's not... I mean, it's worked perfectly for the Liberals, as Michael said. Yeah. Because there's no message from the Conservative Party in this first week of the campaign. Uh, well, I mean, today they got their message through because it was such a big policy drop. So obviously we had to, to give that the time it deserved. But then there's a second story, of course, about, about these other issues, particularly because today Shear was asked, well, why didn't you apologize for the things you said about same-sex marriage? And instead of just saying, I'm sorry, those, you know, I, I don't know what I was thinking or whatever the answer would have been, he, he avoided that as well, which right. is, I, I don't know tactically whether that made sense. Right. I think on the, on the candidate issue, yeah. um, a lot of these attacks have occurred on Twitter. A lot of these attacks, they have been pushed out through whether it's a politician's or a party's account, yeah. and you're seeing these things. I think in that particular context, voters have a built up a certain suspicion or even an internal resistance to those kind of attacks from politicians, right? They kind of feel that if you're, especially if you're putting out a clip, you're misrepresenting the facts. You're not putting everything out there. You're splicing things to say certain things. Mm. So I think overall, is this going to really affect uh, voters' intentions, voter turn? I don't think it's going to really have that kind of effect because overall people are just very skeptical of what pol politicians and political parties do with the kind of information they have for opposition groups and opposition parties. See, I think I disagree and I disagree for the exact reason it worked against the NDP in the provincial election. It worked in 2015 too. Right, which NDP. is that if it creates one of two impressions. If it creates the impression that the overall the Conservative Party is too extreme, there is a basic tolerance moderation threshold that has to be met to be the government of Canada. If people believe, as it happened, for instance, to the Wild Rose in Alberta a number of years ago, that you don't meet that threshold, you don't win. Point number one. Point number two, does Sheer look strong? Right? And right now, he doesn't. He looks like he's being buffeted around by this, in my view, and he needs to take charge of it and look like a leader. Right. So that's what he tried to do, obviously, on the plane last night, but we're still talking about it. So last word, and then I'm going to ask one yeah, more question. Yeah, I think, I think you do have a point there. Don't get me wrong, but given the fact that this happened to every party, then you have to ask yourself, does every party have... They, we all have this issue. Does anybody look really strong? I think especially when the Conservatives are trying to push out some things on some Liberal candidates right now, how does Mr. Trudeau respond to that? I mean, he hasn't been in the media for the past two days, so there's going to be some questions to be asked on his side as well, and we'll see how that party handles it moving okay, forward. Okay, I want to ask one question. So you can't say your own party. That's the one rule here. But <laughs> which, which leader had the best week and why? You knew you can't say it. Just, so that's the caveat. He knows that you can't say it. So. <laughs> well, it's, an, it's, it's very difficult to say because if we, if we look back, the, the party that had some of the lowest expectations going into this yeah. week is the party that had the best no, results no, but, for this week. But no, you can't say that. <laughs> I didn't say... Uh, You've I, already failed that let one. Me say it for <laughs> yes. Let me say it for her. Jagmeet Singh yeah. and the NDP absolutely had the best first week of the campaign. Conservatives had a bad week. Greens had a terrible week. That's also part of why Jagmeet Singh and the NDP had a good week yeah. is because the Greens had a terrible week. But I think to their credit, the NDP looked crisp. Their campaign exceeded expectations in all regards. The competency of the effort, the, the performance yeah. of Singh, the performance in the debate, all that, they come out of week one in the 30 polls. seconds. He really, he really saved you. You saved your butt there. <laughs> I, I agree you. with uh, what David has said. I yeah. think the thing is, though, when you have no expectations of a party and a candidate, of course they're going to do well. I think now the expectations are going to be set a little higher for Singh. Yeah. We'll see if he performs in week two. Right. Mm. Okay. Shakir, Michael, David, that was great. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. you for having me on. Appreciate yeah. it. Coming up, they live in one of the most affordable places in Canada, and even they want to know what the leaders will do about the cost of living. Their campaign concerns next. We want to make sure that people can afford their bills. This is an important measure to help make life more affordable. We will move forward even further to help Canadians afford their homes. It's a big theme on the campaign trail, cost of living. Each party promising to put more money in your wallet, from housing to transit, even your cell phone bill. Even though the economy has been performing well with the best jobs numbers in decades, the anxiety appears to be real and widespread. Canadian households are carrying record levels of debt, and polls consistently put cost of living as a top concern. A lot of it really comes down to how you feel. David Common went to visit a place in Quebec where people can afford to live good lives, but even there he found undertones of anxiety and a sense of being squeezed. Not to make you jealous, but Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu is picturesque. A friendly, historic downtown, there are jobs here, 
cheap daycare, downtown Montreal, only about 40 minutes away, low-cost buses leave every 10 minutes to get commuters there. Oh, and then there's the houses. Average price, just over $300,000. How many times have you moved? Uh, approximately 22. 22 times in your life? Yep. Are you going to move from here? Hopefully not. After all, Anaïs Bureau has what so many Canadians want. Not just the backyard chickens, not even the inexpensive, plentiful local produce. She has affordability. Anybody who's going to, to help us maintain this quality of life is definitely going to have our vote. With the upcoming federal election, our concerns are pretty much the same as we're seeing in the city. Anais and her politically oriented neighbors believe they're better off than many Canadians. Things cost less here. Yet even they feel the squeeze and they're looking for answers. We need more money invested in transportation. Put more money uh, in the development of the city to be sure that we can walk uh, bicycling or take the train, the bus to go working. We really want to work to keep those trees and those green spaces. They are already tuned in to their priorities. Down at the local fair though, some see challenges in their own lives and those challenges will be the issue they vote on. What they can do for the child because you know I'm a mom you know and for for the family and you know, for for improvements uh, for school and for environment. The most important subject for me being an employee of the federal government is the, is the problem with the Phoenix pay issue. L'écologie comme on parle, les, les, l'environnement. Hmm. Honesty. How do you know who to trust? You don't. It's very hard nowadays to know who, who to trust. Yet politicians are now in this community saying, trust me. In the last provincial election, this area chose CAC, the upstart party that ultimately won government, a huge shift, amid questions about whether Saint-Jean may choose change again. And it'll be folks like Anaïs and her family, targeted by promises and policy. And even though she figures she's got it pretty good, there's a question that always comes back in campaigns. Are you better off now? Well, we feel like we're being taxed like we're uh, the higher levels, although we are considered middle class. Plus, with all the cost of housing and all of those things, it's kind of hard to say. We feel that we have so little left at the end. This is a personal question, obviously, but where do you think your money goes? A lot of it goes on housing. A lot of it goes on transportation. We have to have two cars um, just to get around, so that's a big, uh, big thing for us as well. So once we've paid for that, it feels like there's not that much left. Uh, Do you think you're unusual? No, I think we're pretty average. Yeah. Makes you wonder if those in one of Canada's most affordable cities worry about the big financial squeeze, what's going on in places where life is even more expensive? David Common, CBC News, Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, Quebec. In the lead up to election day, I'll be on the road visiting key battleground ridings to help you better understand what's at stake. And tomorrow, I'll be in Trois-Rivières, Quebec. With 78 seats up for grabs, Quebec is already shaping up to be a three-way race between the Liberals and the Conservatives. Wow, merci beaucoup tout le monde, chers amis. Bonjour tout le monde. And a bloc Québécois hoping to rebuild. We have been through a pretty tough time ourselves, and I understand what that means. However, I have a job to do. And can the NDP hang on to any seats in the province? The National Live from Battleground Quebec tomorrow. Looking forward to going. Time for a quick break. When we're back, their vote could shape the political landscape. So we ask young people for their campaign priorities next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, we're launching a new series where Canadian voters have their hard questions answered. First up, where the party stand on climate change. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
On October 21st, every single vote will count, but one group in particular could sway the outcome of this federal election. It's voters under 40, so that's not me. In that group, these six people, they're from all over BC to Newfoundland, Yukon to Toronto, and from all kinds of backgrounds. They're also all right now undecided voters. We're going to follow them throughout this campaign as they make their decisions, and tonight they lay out their priorities. In the upcoming federal election, I'm an undecided voter. In the upcoming weeks, I'm going to be doing my homework and keeping a very close eye on what's going on. I've always voted, will always continue to vote. It's always about jobs here. Like we need to look at the bigger picture. The energy sector, as well as free speech. I like to see the various policy proposals that the parties are going to be putting out, and also the tone that the various uh, leaders set. I just want to know how the various parties are going to improve my life and the lives of all Canadians. My name is Saba Chaudhry. I'm in my 30s and I'm a strategic communications manager living and working in the city of Toronto. I really want to see a party that has a strong platform around climate action. What are the national strategies and policies that will be put into place to ensure that we are saving our planet for future generations? Over the past couple of years, Canada has really established itself as a global voice for climate action. And I simply do not think that it's an option that we roll those efforts back. My name is Ivan J. White. I live in St. George's, Newfoundland, in the riding of Long Range Mountains. My biggest election issue is closing the gap for Indigenous people. We need government to work with us to fix the underlying issues that cause our problems. After voting in four federal elections, I've never seen myself in the governing policy. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm there during the campaign. I'm, I'm in the promises. I'm just, I don't feel that I'm in the policy after that. My name is Emily. I am 20 years old and currently I'm in my second year of undergrad at McGill. I will be looking for an ambitious um, climate agenda. Um, and I've been following a little bit of the uh, SNC-Lavalin um, scandal in the past few months. I plan on going in to vote for a party that I feel will include every single person and who will defend and will fight for all the marginalized communities in Canada. I'm Christian Hebert from Mooseland, Saskatchewan in the southeast corner. My job is I'm a self-employed farmer. My number one issue, as I said, is really lean to small businesses and entrepreneurs, but especially to our export markets. How are we going to rebuild the relationship with these countries? How are we going to expand them? And thirdly, how can we create value add and an, and an incentive to invest in value add in many of the products that we create in Canada, i.e. potash, oil, wheat, canola, and so many others. My name is Petros Kuzmu. I'm a 30-year-old Albertan-born British Columbian, and I'm a management consultant. I am a volunteer tutor and just generally an active member of my community. The affordable housing crisis that we have in some cities like Vancouver, immigration and plurality in Canadian society, um, climate change and energy development. I'm going to be really curious to hear about how the various uh, party leaders are going to be proposing that we resolve some of these. My name is Katie Baudouin. I'm 25 years old and I'm a Canadian paramedic and I live in the Yukon Territory. I am an undecided voter. I am leaning against the Liberal Party just because of Justin Trudeau. I haven't been very impressed with his performance the past couple of years. I am a fan of some things that Maxine Bernier has said uh, regarding our veterans and uh, immigration, uh, as well as the energy sector and free speech. I think as uh, Canadians, we all appreciate our veterans and uh, we want them to feel taken care of. I'm voting in the 2019 federal election because I want my voice to be heard. I mean, we're talking about the next four years of Canada, right? I think this one is going to be particularly historic um, and sets the tone on a number of really big policy issues in this country. I fundamentally believe that democracies work best when we all vote, we all have our say. It really is up to us to show our parties and our leaders what direction we want this country and this economy to move forward in. Hopefully, we can continue to improve it and be at the forefront of the world. That was super interesting, and we're going to get to know all those voters throughout the next number of weeks on the election campaign and, and see how they make up their minds. Next on The National, she already won the U.S. Open, and tonight a prize a little bit closer to home, the moment right after this break.
role model of tennis. She inspired me to be to believe in myself. Aw, some young Bianca and Drescu fans braving the rain to see their hero. The city of Mississauga celebrated the young tennis star today, welcoming her home with a rally, showering her with gifts. Her reaction and her gratitude is our moment of the day. This is crazy. I never thought I would have my own parade before, let alone the key to the city and a street named after me. I have to thank Mayor Bonnie Crombie for everything and her team and the city of Mississauga for putting this together. So my goal today was to not trip in these shoes and to not mess up this speech. So hopefully I can do both. I am a proud Canadian. I am proud to represent this amazing country all around the world. And I am very humbled to celebrate this moment with all of you here today. and with everyone at home, I really, really appreciate it. She's just great. She managed in those heels, which is impressive, and she's humble and graceful, and um, yeah, we should all be very proud. That is The National for September 15th. I'll see you tomorrow night on the road from Quebec. Have a good one.